Years ago, I serendipitously happened upon a personality system called the Enneagram. Although I prefer to use the literal name, the nine-point personality system. When I was first introduced to this system, I was amazed. It was so precise and predictive that I began to believe it must have a biological basis. I went to a conference on personality, and there I met Dr. Eric Schultz. Now, I have to tell you that I was quite smitten by Dr. Schultz because he was drop-dead brilliant. <laughs> a true genius. And he also had happened upon the system, and he suspected as well that there might be a biological basis to it, so we agreed to be research partners, and we ended up researching a bit more than personality. And at our wedding, mm -hmm, we had a cake table and a bar and a blood drawing table <laughs> as part of our research. They're still talking about that wedding. <laughs> but we didn't stop there. At our Christmas party that year, we hooked our friends and family up to EEG equipment. <laughs> Did I mention while we were subjecting them to cold water pain tests? Mm -hmm. But we didn't get enough of a pain range. So at our 4th of July party, we decided that we would repeat the experiment, but this time at electric shocks. No one comes to my parties anymore. <laughs> and someone even said that we needed to have our heads examined. So we did. We had spec scans of our brain, and I was able to predict which part of our brain would have high and low circulation based on our understanding of personality and brain function, and I was 100% right. Yeah. And it was at that point that we said, yes, indeed, we have cracked the code of human personality. We have discovered the biology of the nine-point personality system. Now, if you've ever wondered about personality, is, is it something that you're born with, or is it something that's shaped by your experience? The answer is yes to both. Initially, we're born with a set of genes that gives us a personality that can be very different from our parents and our siblings, which in part explains why children with the same parents under the same roof can turn out so very differently. But the plot thickens, because the very personality that you are born with becomes the lens through which you perceive your first six years and it's during that time that you create mental maps, blueprints of who you are and how the world is. And once those maps are set, they become your self-fulfilling prophecy. I'll give you an example. Two sisters. Betty, the older sister, will describe her childhood this way. Oh, my God, it was a wonderful childhood. I mean, you know, mother, she drank a little bit, and father wasn't always there, but Christmas, ooh, Christmas was the best. If you ask her younger sister, Anne, to describe her childhood, this is what you'll get. Oh, my God, it was a tragic childhood. Mother was a raging alcoholic, and father abandoned us at a very early age in Christmas. Christmas was the worst. Everyone acting happy when we all knew we weren't. Now, you don't have to be Freud to know that those women grew up and had very different outcomes in their life experience. And I believe that the biggest difference wasn't in environment, but in their personality. And if personality can affect the very course of our life, the question becomes, can we affect the course of our personality? And the answer is absolutely yes. And it begins with an understanding of what personality is. So the simplest working definition of personality is how a person thinks, feels, and behaves consistently over time. But we know that as human beings, we're not that consistent. So what we believe creates personality and accounts for the fluctuations in personality lies in neurotransmitters. Now, neurotransmitters are simply chemicals 
that nerves use to communicate with each other. These chemicals pass from one nerve to the next, and before you know it, a whole chain of communication happens. And at the end of that chain, one of three things will be produced, a thought, a feeling, or an action. Hmm. Sounds familiar, eh? Well, it gets even juicier, because if you were to cut a human brain open and stain it, you would find that there are three main neurotransmitter pathways. Each one begins in a specific part of the brain and then branches out, much like these trees. And each one of these neurotransmitters is driven by a single neurotransmitter. You have norepinephrine that regulates how we think, serotonin that regulates how we feel, and dopamine that regulates how we behave. And part of my theory on personality is that what we call personality is simply the high, medium, and low combinations of those neurotransmitters, the set points of those neurotransmitters, and that those set points actually rise and fall a bit, just like your blood pressure does under various conditions. I'm just going to brief you on the two first chemicals, norepinephrine and serotonin, that make up what we call your basic personality. Let's begin with norepinephrine. Norepinephrine is considered a brain adrenaline. So people who have high set points of norepinephrine are the kind of people who think quickly and speak quickly, and they'll often report that they have a hard time turning their brain off at night. People who have a low set point are going to be the kind of people who hit the pillow and they tend to not overthink, they tend to speak slowly, and they really rely on their gut to make decisions. And people who have an average set point, well, kind of fall in the middle, where they're actively problem-solving and then daydreaming, actively problem-solving and daydreaming throughout the day. Now, there are many factors that increase norepinephrine. I'm just going to give you a few examples of the big guys. Stress, sensory overload, and caffeine will all kickstart your brain and get it swirling. And factors that decrease norepinephrine include repetitive muscle movement, just like uh, walking or jogging or even gum chewing. And then there's a neurotransmitter known as GABA, and it inhibits the effect of, nor of norepinephrine. And then you guys are going to like this one, orgasms. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not giving you homework. <laughs> I'm just reporting the facts. <laughs> So let's move on to serotonin. Sunny serotonin is the neurotransmitter that's related to well-being. People who are high in serotonin don't have to try to be positive. They don't have to remember to look at the half-full glass. No, these people are born with rose-colored glasses. And people who are born with low set point of serotonin are called reactive, which means that they experience and respond more intensely than most of us and generally have a temper and or anxiety. And people who are born with an average set point, well, we call those people emotionally neutral. Now, factors that decrease serotonin include stress, pain, and fatigue. And I'd like you all to remember this because whenever you experience stress, pain, and fatigue and your serotonin levels drop, it makes you more susceptible to stress, pain, and fatigue. But luckily, there are more factors that help to increase serotonin than there are to decrease them. And those factors include carbohydrates, which is why we crave carbohydrates under stress. Also, happy music, antidepressants, and kindness. Kindness boosts serotonin levels in both the giver and the receiver. And when all else fails, there's always chocolate. Mm -hmm. So let's go back to the basic personality. Let's take the high, medium, and low possibilities and combinations of norepinephrine and combine them with the high, medium, and low combinations of serotonin. Mathematically, what you'll get from that are nine possible combinations. And those possible combinations will yield nine basic human personalities. Each one of these personalities has a very specific viewpoint, a very specific motivation, a very specific 
language. Did you know that there are nearly 7,000 recognized languages in the world? Well, I'm here to tell you that I believe if you understand all of these personality types, then you will become fluent in human. Mm -hmm. Now, you see that symbol in the middle? That is not a satanic sign. That is actually a map that shows you the direction of integration or disintegration. That is, which personality type will temporarily visit another personality type under optimal conditions or stress conditions. And when you really understand the system, the biology of it, you'll come to understand that we're all just one or two steps away from any personality type, which means that essentially we have all personality types within us. They're very much like a radio that has all of the channels. You know, you hang out at your favorite radio station, sort of your set point, but you can visit other stations. And in the very same way, we believe that you can visit other personality types. Now, it turns out that Don Risso and Russ Hudson, two of the world leaders in the study of the Enneagram, started observing this nine-point personality system. And they noticed that not only do people move from one personality type to the other, but that actually within each type, we have various levels of health, high, medium, and low functioning within each of us. And when they made that a discovery, they transformed this fluid but flat system into a three-dimensional dynamic system, which is as simple or as complex and rich as the humans it seems to map. Now I'm going to give you an example of how when you combine two of these neurotransmitters, you can get very different types of personalities. Let's take an example of high norepinephrine and couple that with average serotonin. So what you're going to get is a person who's thinking very quickly but with emotionally neutral thoughts. So this person is going to be thinking like, what makes that work? How does that happen? How do I fix that? And what you're going to get from that combination is the fifth of the nine personalities known as the thinker or the observer, also known as the nerd. A high example of this personality type Albert Einstein. In a low-functioning example, the Unabomber. Quite the range, don't you think? Mm-hmm. Do you notice something that they have in common? The hair, exactly. Well, one of the reasons that they have that in common is because this personality type is wired to not be concerned or constrained by social convention. So they don't care what you think about them. And that's why they are some of the most original thinkers in the world, because they have that internal permission to think outside of the box. Let's take another example. What happens when you combine low norepinephrine with low serotonin? Well, you're going to get somebody who doesn't think that much. They're not going to overthink, but they will react. And when you put that combination together, you get the eight personality, known as the boss or the leader. This is a very direct person, very straightforward person. My way or the highway, make it happen, do or die. An average example, John Wayne. Low functioning, Saddam Hussein. An eight, going bad. He took that same energy of leadership, that same strength, but used it to bully people instead of to protect them, which is a good reason to be nice to your kids. Speaking of kids, I used to have a pet pig. Her name was Peggy Suey. I really loved Peggy. And I would go to pet her, and she would run away squealing. And then she developed this annoying habit of butting my ankles. I was very distressed by this, and I eventually learned that pigs do not like to be approached from above because it feels like a predator coming down on them. They actually prefer if you pet their chinny chin chin. And that butting of my ankles, that was her way of saying she liked me. Aw. So here we were, two sentient beings, really crazy about each other, but driving each other crazy because we weren't speaking the same language. And then I thought about people. I can't tell you how many times, in the name of love, 
I have seen parents trying to impose their personality viewpoint, their personality values on their children who sometimes did not have the same personality and who were wired very differently. And these children grew up to be adults who were perfectly fine people, but felt like something was really wrong with them. I have a vision for the future. One day, it's my fantasy that when a baby is born, we'll give the parents the child's personality from the blood test. And then we'll add a little booklet, a little instruction and manual that explains the care and feeding of this personality. But until then, because that could be a long time off, if you're a researcher or an educator or a parent or simply someone who wants to be a better person, please consider learning about this system and using it as a tool to improve yourself and your relationships because from your personal relationships, you're only one step away from the workplace. And from the workplace, we're only one step away from the community. And from the community, we're only one step away from the world. And I know that sounds grand, but I'm a grandmother of two very special human beings, Caleb Thomas and Scout Amanda. And I really want them to live in a world where we get along and where we embrace our differences and where we finally understand that even with all of our differences, in the end, in so many more ways, we are all